Whether you grew up in church or not, you've likely heard of a man from the Bible named John the Baptist. His name brings to mind thoughts of an outcast wearing weird clothes made from camel's hair, living in the wilderness, eating strange food. You may even recall one of his famous lines about being unworthy to tie Jesus' sandals. Details about John the Baptist appear in all four of the Gospel letters. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to take a look at what Matthew wrote about John in chapter 3 of his letter. He says, In those days John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. That's Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Millie, look what I got. Whether you know who John the Baptist is or not, I think what is really important is digging in and seeing if we can discover the answer to a couple of questions. First of all, why did God need somebody to prepare the way for Jesus? And secondly, if that's what John was doing, why was he all the way out in the wilderness? Why was he calling all the people from Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding area to come all the way out to the middle of nowhere to hear what he had to say? I think you can learn a lot about the answers to those questions by learning about these horse blinders. In order to do that, I've got to track down a horse expert. I'm here in beautiful North Idaho to talk with award-winning equestrian rider, trainer, and breeder, Tiffany Corson. Tiffany has been involved in horses professionally for over 20 years, competing in dressage and cross country and training hundreds of students over the years. She's also heavily involved in helping maintain a rare breed of draft horses called the American Cream. With only about 400 purebred American Creams alive, her efforts to breed and train up future creams are invaluable. And more important than all of these accolades is the fact that she's my little sister and I am so incredibly proud of her. <laughs> and uh, she loves being on camera, not. But I really appreciate you uh, teaching us a little bit. So what do you have in your hands that you went and got out of the tack room? So this Here, I'll take the apple from well, I'll have. She needs it, so she puts her head down. Okay. Because I'm very short. Ah, tricks. I <laughs> For see. tricks. You know, I'll give her something, she gives me something. Okay. Anyways, um, this is just the breast collar part of the harness. Um, we have other harnesses that have collars that go over and hames, but... Um, they got me this harness because it separates in three pieces so I can actually lift it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, let's see how this one goes on. Okay. It's kind of a pain. You want help? There you go. Look, look, look. Get down. You got it over here? Uh -huh. There you go. And then this flips over her back. Like that. Okay. And then we go get the other two pieces. All right. So we got more parts and pieces. Yeah. What uh, What do you have in your hands there? This is called the saddle, and we and then it has the shaft holders on it. And when she's in a team, we'll take these off. But we're gonna hook her to the sleigh, so we need those. Okay. Why is it called the saddle? Does somebody ride her? Um. You know, it's where the saddle goes. And I'm not exactly sure other than this, the placement of it. And I know in um, when they have a huge um, team of horses, when like they have an eight up or what, you can see like when the queen has her carriage being drawn, there's people that actually sit on the saddle and the, one of the, the head horses, the driving horses, so um, to have more control 
on that team. But I think it's because they have to be extra careful with royalty and stuff. But <laughs> sure. maybe that's why it's called the saddle. But that's where I'm just thinking it's probably the placement. Okay. So that goes on next. And <laughs> yeah. then what is this apparatus that I'm holding here? That is, is this a, a crouper? And then this goes around her butt, the hold. So like when she is going down um, a hill and the, the, the tugs get pulled uh, on and the holdbacks, these are the holdbacks, airways that'll keep the horse from, the, the sleigh from coming up on her. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. So like this holds her pull and that helps her stop. Okay. All right. So accelerator and brakes. I got it. Exactly. All right. Well, let's put on the next part. Okay. All right, so next up is going to be this uh, headgear, which in horse land is called what? Bridle. It's called a bridle. I knew that. I was just teasing. But this bridle looks very different. Uh, I was showing people one of these earlier. This is a lot different than a typical horse bridle. What is going on with all this extra stuff on here? Well, it's a driving bridle. So you have, you have the the blinders that prevent the horse to seeing, well, in this case, it will be the sleigh, the sleigh following her. And um, and then this is the holdbacks, or the, the check reins, sorry. And so that keeps her head from falling down. Okay. And then you, you have the bit. And okay. And so when we say blinders and we put these on a horse, like, do they literally blind the horse? I mean, is the horse like no. blindfolded or can they no, see? No, horses can see from, so the horse can't see directly in front of them or directly behind them, but they have, since they're a prey animal, they have um, peripheral vision. And so what we're trying to stop her from seeing is from here. So from where the shafts will be and the and everything following her, she, but she'll still be able to see where she's going. She'll see, you know, like if she's going and turning in directions and so she still has her sight of where she's going but not where she's been okay we get a really good look here at exactly how i mean here i am just to the side of her and definitely cannot see me over this way okay. um what are some of the benefits like of having those blinders on like what do they is it sort of a functional thing is it a safety thing um it's really a safety thing because um, it's sometimes hard for horses to get over the fact that they can't get away because they're prey animals, so they can't get away from what's following them. And some horses can develop to, the, they've been driving long enough that they're fine with whatever, you know, they get desensitized. But when you, most of the time when you're driving a horse, they, it kind of blows their mind. For that so we just kind of prevent them and then they get desensitized from the pressure and of the shafts and everything and then they go they listen to you instead of and what you're saying to them verbally and with the lines that they listen to you instead of what's following them it sounds a lot like christmas all right so you gotta go on the side. I'll trade you spots here. All right, so now we have bells and uh, kind of joking around that it sounds like Christmas and we're gonna go on a one horse sleigh out in the in the snow here in a minute. But is uh, are the bells just purely decorative or is there some purpose for those? No, the bells are actually another part of training a horse to get desensitized to things. So Sleighs are a little bit different than any other wagon or things like that because the wagons have a, sorry, it's probably loud. Um, the wagons have a consistent noise and the horses, like I said, the, over time, the horses learn by repetition. Mm -hmm. And so the sleigh actually is not very repetitive. Like it'll hit a dry spot or it hits a rock or even certain snows sound very loud and very squeaky, like your fingernail on the chalkboard kind of noise. And so um, we use the, the sleigh bells to actually um, desensitize her from all those noises and stuff. And, um, and so, we, and then also sleigh bells were used back in the day because 
and back in Europe when they used to do it to get around, the the aisleways are so narrow that you use the sleigh bells to tell people you're coming. Okay, nice, nice. But, and well, plus, it sounds like Christmas. And it sounds like Christmas. So let's put these on and get a feel for where they go on the horse and kind of how they sound with her moving around. Oh. Well, you look at that. They just go right over her neck. Okay, so you have a jingle bell necklace. Some people hook them onto the hames or, you know, a one on on the buckles or something, but we have little ones that just great go over their necks. All right. Well, look right at here. her. So she is ready to roll, ready to hook up, and yep. uh, we got to drag a sleigh out and go for a sleigh ride now that we went to all this trouble. Right. All right, so why do we uh, walk her out like this without you just hooking her directly up to the sleigh? Well, it's called ground driving, and we take her out like this, so kind of gets her in the mindset, see how she's kind of antsy at first. She has um, halting problems, but anyways, um, so it kind of gets her in, it's kind of like lunging a horse, gets them in the mindset of working. And then we can just drive her right up to the sleigh and then hook her up from there instead of have to lead her out. All right, let's take her for a walk. All right, walk on care. I'm G. Good Gary. Walk on, not trot on. Back from the sleigh ride and back in the barn, and it is a little bit chilly in here. We're also back to our questions. Why did God need somebody to prepare the way for Jesus? And why was he so far out in the wilderness calling people out there to meet him there? And I think God knows how self-centered people can be, how easily we can get uh, just hyper-focused on our own priorities, our own goals, our own dreams, our own desires, our own jobs, right? Like we get tunnel vision on our own life. And essentially, over time, we sort of grow our own blinders because we don't want to be distracted by what's going on around us. Like we, we get so self-focused, so self-centered that our lives can easily become just about what we can see in front of us. We don't want to see the consequences of our choices and our actions, the, the way our sin hurts the people over here, the way our sin hurts the people over there, the trauma or damage or uh, you know consequences of mistakes in our past. We like to have those blinders on. And I think that's where we see John the Baptist's mission really come to life, is he was a, a voice in the wilderness, one crying out for people to repent from their sins. In this analogy, it would be like John calling people to strip off their blinders, to like wake up to what's going on around them so that they could see around them in their life the consequences of their actions, the consequences of their sin, so that they could deal with their sin. He, he was calling them out to like wake up, recognize, get your heart ready to meet the Messiah, the, the Savior. If you still got your blinders on when he comes, you're going to miss him. He could walk right by you and you won't even be ready. And so he was calling them out to repent and be aware and deal with their sin and get rid of those blinders. I also think it's really significant that John was out in the wilderness, away from Jerusalem, away from the hustle and bustle of the city, kind of like we learned about as Tiffany was showing us the bells that you put on a horse to help distract them from the noise going on all around them. I think that in a similar fashion, we sort of develop a lot of bells in our life, right? Like some of them are those cell phones that we carry around, all of the things that just keep us distracted. It sort of numbs us to everything happening around us all the time. 
And I think there was something really interesting and powerful about John calling people to this message of repentance, like strip off your blinders, get aware of your sin, but also where he called them to do that, out to the wilderness. It was like, it's time to pull the blinders off. It's time to lay down your bells, the distractions and the noises, and to get away from everything where there's peace, there's calm, you can see the beauty of nature, and you can, for a minute, just pause and reflect on your own sin, your own actions and the consequences of those actions so that you can deal and not just keep stuffing that stuff in your back pocket, kind of hiding it with the chaos and busyness of your everyday life. Going to the wilderness was an important part of the call to repentance. But even beyond that, John warned the crowds that coming to the wilderness for this baptism of repentance, it wasn't just a one-time event. Let's take a look in Luke's letter and see the other instructions that John went on to give some of the followers in the crowd. He says, Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. The crowd asked, What should we do? John replied, If you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? asked some scholars. And John replied, Don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. You know, when we read in Scripture about God sending John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus, I think it's one of the ways that we see God's grace at work. And God's grace is still very much at work now, maybe even more so through His Spirit, where He sends His Spirit to each of you to tug at your heart, to make those little whispers in your mind, to ask you if you're ready. Are you, are you ready to let go of your sin? Are you ready to stop trying to figure out this life and do everything on your own? Are you ready to bend a knee and meet the King? Not only through His Spirit, but through other people. God is continuing to work to help uh, call you forward, to be ready, to call you away from the busyness of your life, out to the wilderness per se, to invite you to do a heart check, get your self ready so that as you come to know Jesus, you don't miss it. You don't miss him, that your heart is prepared. And I wonder as we're thinking about that, if there are people in your life that even come to mind right now that uh, are people that you think, wow, that's a person I really think God has used in my life to help prepare me to meet Jesus. And had I not had that relationship with them and the, the conversations we had and the hard talks, perhaps I wouldn't have been ready to know him. I also wonder if perhaps you are somebody that God wants to use to reach out and extend a hand to someone else, to invite them to get ready to meet Jesus. Do you think maybe God is inviting you to help someone else be prepared to meet his son? If this message resonates with you and you wanna dig in and study more, you can find a link for a free study guide in the description below. And if you're ready to follow Jesus, we would love to help you get started on your journey to be a disciple. Please reach out and let us know, and we would love to connect with you. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to... Dang it, that was so good. We were so close. That's the collar. The collar. We've got the collar. Breast collar. Breast collar. Mm -hmm. We've got the saddle. True. And the brakes. No, there's a Cooper and the butt strap. Butt strap, Mini Cooper, no. saddle, <laughs> and the accelerator. These things are just like a small European car. No. I got it. All right, what goes on next? No. Filming with horses. <laughs>